All right. Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Developing Greening STEM Projects and Proposals. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to uh, give an overview of the Greening STEM model, as well as some tips for developing projects and grant applications, as we currently have three Greening STEM grant opportunities. And we're also going to hear today from uh, agency representatives from the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and the US Forest Service, because those are the three funding opportunities currently available. We are recording today, and this uh, recording will be made available uh, for those who have to leave early, came late, or perhaps were unable to attend but registered. Uh, we should have that available uh, later this week, along with the slide deck that uh, we're using today. I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Robert Sundry. I am the Program Director for Environmental Education at NEF, and I'm glad that you're here with us today. If you're not familiar with NEF, uh, we are a, a congressionally chartered 501c3 nonprofit complement uh, to the EPA. We are nonpartisan and non advocacy. We are charged with advancing environmental literacy nationwide, and we help facilitate public private partnerships in the support of environmental education. Our purpose is to cultivate and uh, an environmentally uh, conscious and responsible public. Our vision is that people's everyday actions are going to be guided by an understanding and concern for the well-being of people and the planet. And our mission is to make the environment more accessible, relatable, relevant, and connected to the daily lives of all Americans. We do that through three program focus areas, K-12 education, health, and conservation. Our K-12 education focus areas currently include Greening STEM, EE in Focus, our new monthly newsletter, which is the successor to uh, our longstanding EE week in April, and also our annual competition, Climate Superstars, which occurs in October each year. The Greening STEM model uh, is an experiential approach to teaching STEM subjects using the natural environment and real world challenges to engage learners. It's an adaptable hands-on and inquiry-based approach where learners take an active role in developing a 21st century skill set. It's a combination of classroom and field experiences that engender environmental awareness and a stewardship ethic. It's also an interdisciplinary and collaborative model for developing STEM ecosystems. There are some real benefits for educators and learners, including that greening STEM helps make the environmental issues relevant and accessible for both educators and learners, increasing environmental literacy. And formal and non-formal educators gain experience and confidence by collaborating to design, develop, and co-deliver standards-based STEM learning activities. Within Greening STEM, there are four instructional approaches that we have bundled together. And the first, you are more than likely familiar with, place-based learning which uses all aspects of the local, natural, and built environment, including cultural, historical, and sociopolitical um, situations uh, and concerns uh, as an integrating context for learning. In addition, we acknowledge that today's educator uh, is utilizing uh, either a state adopted version of the next generation science standards 
or some equivalent set of standards. And so we call this three-dimensional learning, referring to the three pillars found in the NGSS, which are the disciplinary core ideas, science and engineering practices, and cross-cutting concepts. In addition, we embrace and encourage folks to use project-based learning. And the six best practices of this instructional approach include intellectual challenge, authenticity, public product, collaboration, project management, and reflection, which enable learners to master the academic skills and gain content knowledge while developing 21st century skills and personal agency. And then lastly, uh, for lack of a better term, we're calling this instructional approach community-based learning, which opens the door for elements of cultural relevance, uh, social equity, and environmental justice. Uh, topics and, and uh, ways of, of looking at uh, these environmental problems that will challenge learners to differentiate between what are environmental problems in need of solutions and environmental issues where people disagree about their resolution based on differing beliefs and values. So putting it all together, uh, a greening stem checklist would include the four proven instructional strategies, place-based learning, three-dimensional learning, project-based learning, and community-based learning. Collaborative interdisciplinary partnerships between the formal and non-formal educational partners. What hopefully will grow into some kind of a long-term sustainable relationship, maybe even a STEM ecosystem. And the real world challenges and problems involving the natural environment that we see in the news each day. Our first uh, guest presenter today is Linda Rosenblum from the uh, National Park Service. And I will turn things over to her at this time. Uh, as Robert said, my name is Linda Rosenblum. I'm the Education Program Manager for the Washington Office of Interpretation and Education Volunteers uh, with the National Park Service. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the NPS has been interacting with the Greening STEM model and some opportunities for schools and parks to uh, work together in the program. Uh, I was trying to follow uh, Robert's outline a little bit that he gave us for the agenda. So he talks, he asked us to talk a little bit about the history in, of the NPS and the education mission. So um, for all of you parkies out there, this is old hat, but for maybe some of you folks from other agencies, um, the National Park Service was established in 1916 uh, when the Organic Act was signed. Um, there were national parks in existence prior to that, um, Yellowstone, Hot Springs, several others, um, but there was not an agency uh, created to oversee all of those federal um, parks and lands at the time. The Organic Act uh, specifically had this section in the quotes there to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein to pr provide the enjoyment of the same in such a manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. So that's a, it's kind of a mouthful, but that's the basic mission of the Park Service is twofold. It's both a preservation mission and also uh, a recreational and educational mission. So the Organic Act directs the, the NPS to do both of those things. And that sometimes those may uh, come in a little bit of conflict. Today, they are beautiful. I have not been down there. <laughs> okay, so um, most NPS education is done at the park level. Um, again, for those of you not in the agency, the, the National Park Service is very decentralized. Um, yes, we do have the national office where I work, and then there's also regional offices and then individual parks. 
Um, but for the most part, we don't necessarily have line, I, line authority over uh, the parks from the national offices. So um, we can make opportunities available uh, and initiatives available for parks to participate in, but most, most uh, education programming is generated at the grassroots level and implemented at the grassroots level. Um, so what we've done at the national office over uh, decades, <laughs> efforts have been made to provide consistency and uniformity across the service by providing um, guidance, branding, and offering service-wide programming. And, and going back to the goals that Robert was talking about with the greening STEM, some of the mission and the goals for NPS education uh, align with those really closely in that we are also using local, state, or national standards, um, whether that be the next gen science standards or uh, National Council for Social Studies, or I know Common Core has fallen out of, uh, out of favor in many states, but at one time there were 45 states all uh, aligned under the Common Core as well. We do focus heavily on place-based learning. We offer teacher professional development um, at a national level with the Teacher Ranger Teacher Program. And then many parks offer their own uh, teacher workshops and teacher uh, training days. We try to be cross-curricular cross so that uh, you can use natural resources to teach history subjects, vice versa. We try to engage in real life learning activities, citizen science. Science, those sorts of things. And again, um, three-dimensional learning model that Robert was talking about. Next slide. So some of the education programs um, that we have been working with at the national office, um, the 21st Century Community Learning Centers, which is what we're gonna be focusing on here today. Uh, the Teacher Ranger Teacher Program, which is um, another program that I manage at the national office, which is a collaboration with the University of Colorado Denver, where we provide uh, a six week teacher professional development opportunity where a teacher will be recruited by a park to work specifically at that site uh, while they take an online course with the university and earn three graduate credits through the university. And the, the point of the professional development is that it, your dollar for dollar uh, is, expanded because each teacher then can impact dozens, if not hundreds of kids with the training that you provide at the teacher level. We also support an education portal where there, it's an online uh, database where we have all of our education uh, content available through a searchable database. Um, we have Parks as Classrooms, which is a branding of the, uh, different levels of education. So parks at the park level, at the regional level, or at the national level can all use the Parks as Classroom brand, which is then recognizable. Uh, we have lots of distance learning opportunities, and those have been growing exponentially since COVID. Um, and of course, we have been working with partners um, to promote recreational activities also as education, um, like our recreational fishing programs. It's an opportunity to provide STEM education through outdoor recreation. So the 21st Century Learning Centers is the uh, current program that we're partnering with NIFON. It first piloted with the National Park Service in 2014. Um, since then, we've had several rounds of uh, grant funding through the Department of Education. The goal of the 21st Century Community Learning Centers is to provide after school STEM enrichment education uh, for schools and youth organizations. So in, this is not necessarily specifically for school. You may have boys and girls clubs or 4-H clubs or uh, scouting groups. It's each state Department of Education can select um, what schools or youth organizations to be recipients of the 21st Century Learning Centers uh, funding. And then 
we as federal agencies receive funding on the other end that we can distribute to our parks to develop activities for these um, schools and youth organizations to participate in. Um, so we've been working with NEF now for several years uh, to offer grant funding to NPS units. And then they in turn create and implement greening STEM model programs for the schools and youth organizations participating in the program. So we're, we're essentially providing uh, enrichment activities to complement those STEM education programs that the schools and youth groups are already working on on their end. We as federal agencies then can uh, provide some additional opportunities. Um, currently, we're beginning another grant opportunity for parks. Um, I believe at the end of March, is that correct? When the uh, RFP will open up and parks can apply for additional funding. Um, and this, this uh, grant program will be able to implement through the end of 2024. Um, so as an example, a case study, uh, we use the Saguaro uh, case study for a lot of our presentations because it's such a great example. Um, what they did was the park partnered with some local tribal schools. They engaged uh, community tribal members in the program. And what they did was set out uh, camera traps out in their uh, natural areas and tried to document five species of carnivores that have not been seen in Saguaro Park for over 10 years. Um, and then park staff made presentations to the students to introduce them to the species that they're looking for. The students um, gathered the data, they reviewed, they organized, they made uh, hypotheses, they made plans on how they can strategize on why they think these carnivores disappeared, what could they do to improve the environment that might bring them back? Um, was it food sources? Was there environmental uh, pollution? Were there other factors? They had to gather all of that information um, through a series of um, not only using the camera traps, but looking at food sources and scat and uh, tracking methods and all of and also looking at other species in the environment. And then they uh, presented to their community what their conclusions and what their, their uh, plans to uh, end or improve the environment or improve the opportunity for the carnivores to return to Suwaro. So it's a, it's a really great citizen science project. The kids got to do real life hands-on science and also to take a look at a real problem and, and uh, think through some solutions and work with their community uh, in providing some answers. So that's the end of mine and I'll turn it back over. There's my contact information if you need to get in touch with me. Um, I'm sure they'll have the uh, emails and stuff available for you guys after the program. Thanks. Yes, thank you, uh, Linda, much appreciated. Our next presenter today is Rachel Bayer from the Bureau of Land Management. I'm sorry, from the U.S. Forest Service. <laughs> you, got your, you got your Rachels mixed up. <laughs> I apologize, it's been a challenging day. Not a, not a problem at all. <laughs> Take it away, Rachel, before I say something else. <laughs> You're good. I'm Rachel Bear. I'm an environmental education specialist at the Forest Service. Uh, there will be another Rachel coming up in a second with the Bureau of Land Management. So you get two Rachels today, which is fun. Um, and I'm just excited to get to, to chat with you all today a little bit about the work that the Forest Service has been doing in collaboration with NEEF around greening STEM. A um, little bit of history. Uh, we've been around a little bit longer than the um, National Park Service since 1905. Um, but as um, you know, Linda mentioned with how the Park Service is structured, the Forest Service is structured similarly in that you know, we are very decentralized as well. 
with much of our work taking place at the local level in terms of conservation education. Um, but we don't, uh, like the Park Service, we are not um, giving specific line item funds to those regions and local areas to do specific conservation education programs. We attempt to provide um, capacity um, and, and support um, in other ways um, through, out of our Washington office. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so our little bit of our history here with Greening STEM, go ahead and just give it a few clicks. Yeah, you know, two more. Um, I, I put too much animation on my slides. I need to stop doing that. <laughs> um, so we started our um, Greening STEM program in collaboration with me fairly recently. Um, back in um, 2020, we did a demonstration project in Hawaii, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that here shortly. Um, and once we were able to kind of complete that demonstration project um, and see that our model could work, um, we went ahead with um, more funding uh, or more projects this past year. They're happening right now. Um, and we had three projects um, funded in California, Puerto Rico, and Rhode Island. Um, and then moving into the future, we're hoping to continue to offer these greening STEM um, opportunities, uh, assuming the funding is there to allow us to do so. Um, so we can go ahead to the next slide. So why are we bothering with greening STEM? So I'm going to link this back to our, you know, I'm going to start kind of looking at the big picture with the, the Forest Service and what are our agency priorities. Um, from our, our and um, unlike the National Park Service that focuses on preservation, the Forest Service is focused on conservation. Um, so similar, um, but a little bit of a different um, uh, lens there in terms of we um, aren't necessarily preserving all of our resources, we are conserving them, but they are getting active use. Um, but as part of our strategic plan, we do want to be engaging partners and educators um, in developing, distributing, and using high quality conservation education. Um, and the Forest Service also has a number of core values, which include service, interde interdependence, conservation, and diversity, which you'll see as we go through here, um, conservation education and um, greening STEM really align with those core values. Um, within then conservation education, we have priorities of delivering environmental education and career exploration opportunities to youth. Um, we want to increase environmental literacy and stewardship actions, as well as support our communities, especially underserved communities, our educators, partners, as well as state and national forests. So then when we go to greening STEM, really allows us to hit on each of these things. Um, we're using, um, we're teaching STEM using the environment and real world challenges. Um, we're doing that problem solving through place and project based learning that Robert talked about. We're supporting partnerships that are driving stewardship on, on the land. Um, and we're reaching underserved youth um, and engendering a stewardship ethic and exploration of green careers. So you kind of see how those are tiering um, one to the next. So we can go ahead to the next slide. So what is going to make for a successful Forest Service Greening STEM project? We really want to see um, those strong partnerships being in place between a school, a nonprofit, and a national or state forest. So we're a little bit different um, than our friends at the Park Service and BLM, I think. I could be misspeaking here, but we're a little bit different in that we have um, our state forests, uh, which we well, they're not our, they're the state agency for us, but we partner um, with our state agencies and the forest that they work on. So our projects can take place at either a national forest or a state forest. Um, in our demo project that happened in Hawaii, there are no national forests in Hawaii. Um, that was a collaboration with our urban and community forestry program at the Forest Service in collaboration with the Department of Land and Natural Resources in Hawaii, where the students were then able to engage in looking at, in working on issues facing their local community and state lands. Um, we also want to see those various learning elements that Robert talked about integrated, you know, the three-dimensional place project and community-based. Uh, we can go ahead and click, go ahead and click again. Um, we want to see real world local challenges um, being explored and addressed. So not only do we want to see the students getting out there and collecting data and doing research and, um, you know, exploring those three dimensions of learning, we want them to then be thinking up, okay, well, if this is the issue, um, how can we work to resolve it? What, what can our role be in helping to address that issue? Um, and we want to have career exploration. Our hope is to really inspire these youth to explore various natural resource and green careers that are available to them. Um, and, you know, we, we want to see that career pipeline growing. And then lastly, we do 
hope to target underserved communities, those that have been historically marginalized um, or under-resourced. Um, so then my last slide here, um, kind of thinking about like project logistics, we'd like to see at least um, one pre-activity that's engaging the students before they head out into the field. Um, the demo project happened during COVID. <laughs> so they managed to pull this off um, in a virtual space, which was pretty impressive. So they had virtual classroom activities prior to heading out into the field. Um, and then we can go ahead and click. And then we want to have at least one field-based activity. Then these is, this is where the students should really be getting into that data-driven um, community, place-based, problem-based um, exploration. They're um, exploring different elements to their community and public lands. Um, they're making observations and learning about the issues. So with our, our demo project in Hawaii, they were able to have two optional forest field trips um, where they explored threats to the health of their watershed um, and were able to learn multiple data collection techniques. And then following those field-based activities, we wanna make sure that we're having, you know, they go out, they collect the data, okay, so what? So they need to come back and be analyzing that, making meaning from it, developing, um, and potentially even implementing their ideas for how to address these issues. So we're hoping to see some sort of presentation that's relevant to the community members, decision makers, et cetera, come out of their project. So for instance, in our, our um, demo project, the students were able to develop a plan for improving their watershed. Um, they, they developed a native plant shed house and a um, way to grow native plants for use by their local watershed partnership. So, and as a result of all of their work, hopefully you end up with some project success. So last click there, Robert. Um, and we, so um, the high school that was involved in our demo project, Pearl City High School, has seen their enrollment increase and some additional, you know, um, they're, they're viewed with greater support within their leadership community as well. The, the value of the program um, is more readily available to their leadership, which as we all know in the field of education is extremely important. Um, and there is a um, case study about this demo project on the um, NEEF website. I'll get the link and I can put it in the chat for anybody who would like to learn more about it. And I think that is all I had. Thank you, Rachel, number one. <laughs> And Rachel Sowards is our next presenter. And Rachel is with Bureau of Land Management. So please feel free to take it away, Rachel. Yeah, Rachel number two here. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to talk about greening STEM. This has definitely been a process that I think all of us um, have been trying to figure out on how it best fits with our agency. And for those who aren't real familiar um, with the Bureau of Land Management, we are a multiple use agency. And I would say education is essential to the way the BLM works to achieve its mission to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of our public land. And when you look at um, the BLM's history and how in the 1940s it was this merger of the grazing office and the general land office. It was really um, a jumble of conflicting laws until 1976 when we were formalized in the into the Federal Land and Policy Management Act, FLIPMA. And you know, for a long time, the BLM really wasn't doing much in the way of education, and it really took off um, in the 1990s. And at that time, we were housed under the Division of Communications. And, it, and then in the, the early aughts, we um, were moved into the National Conservation Lands and Community Partnerships Directorate. And during this time, there was a great um, uh, movement to formalize uh, our partnership with NEEF and grow what was the Hands on the Land program. And the BLM definitely was um, at the forefront of that with all, um, all the agencies go. And at one point we probably had 94 different Hands on the Land sites. And it was our way to um, really encourage offices to get out and do more education programs. And it was really successful. A lot of those were with elementary school students. Um, many of them were linked to curriculum and they were had strong community partnerships and with schools and nonprofits. And many of them continue today. 
As we move into this um, new realm of greening STEM, we're focusing more on middle school and high school students. And it's an opportunity to dig a little deeper. Um, and one of the things that we keep focusing on in our agency is this continuum of lifelong engagement with the public. And one of the ways that we can grab people early on is through our education in youth engagement programs. And then hopefully they come back or partner with some of the youth core organizations, work with them and work with us or come back and work for us as well. And then leading to lifelong stewardship as well and continuing to be volunteers on public lands. And so this is, we see this education piece as a key component to first grabbing people at that younger age and engaging them so they are um, active participants in public land management for the rest of their lives. Now, one of the things that um, we have seen that has been really successful in greening STEM, hands on the land, and some of our other education programs is this community partnership piece. So just to give you an idea, for every dollar that the BLM spends on education youth engagement programs, partners bring an additional 46 cents. So it really is a nice um, complement to what we're trying to do and, and helps further our program with our limited budget. Last year, we launched our first greening STEM demonstration project at McGinnis Canyons in uh, National Conservation Area in just outside of Grand Junction, Colorado. And they have a very uh, strong partnership with the Colorado Canyons Association. And um, to talk about that project will highlight how someone could be successful with a project proposal. So one of the things that they did really well is they looked at what is an existing land management natural resource issue, whether it just was recently identified, it was identified in a resource management plan, um, but what is something that they are currently trying to tackle? And then what they are dealing with is invasive knapweed along the Colorado River corridor. And one of the ways to treat that is with gall wasps. And so they were able to meet with the um, science, environmental science teacher and work with a group of students and take them out on the river and look at biologically intact, diverse ecosystems, and then ones that were just Napweed, and then they were also able to uh, release the gall wasps. So this is the very first time that they were able to go out and do this. Now they are going out again this spring. So we only have this one data point um, from the very first spring. So it'll be interesting to compare and see what they are able to see this spring when they go out again. Um, but when we are looking at successful proposals. That's the very first thing we want to see. How is this tackling an active management issue of how we're managing the land? And for years, there has been this notion in the BLM that education programs are just this nice, touchy-feely, cute thing that we do to engage with the public. And we're really trying to actively change that perception and get managers to recognize that these programs are a critical management tool and they're they should be utilized just like any other management tool that um, we use. And so when thinking, we've developed a spreadsheet and in the breakout groups, I'll show that with um, anyone who attends the BLM breakout group, but to first of all, identify what is the, you know, we often say environmental phenomenon or our, our natural resource land management issue. And is there space in there that high school or middle school students could work on a component of solving that problem? We don't expect them to solve the whole thing, but can we be flexible enough in our management of the resource that we allow space for the students to be engaged? And that's what we're looking for, number one. And very similar to how Rachel talked about with the Forest Service, looking at pre-field trip, um, in-class activities, def at least one on the ground, hands-on um, 
monitoring that's going to contribute to the science and the management of the land, and then a, a post activity in some way to share their findings with the public, um, to either teach it to some younger students, but somehow pass on that knowledge that has been gained. And um, we are, I feel like our little worksheet we've developed kind of breaks down some of these little details and gets you to um, answer some questions and work through what would then lead to a successful proposal. So that is um, how we would like to see Greening STEM projects successfully implemented within the Bureau of Land Management. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, as you just heard, uh, Rachel shared some tips and, and uh, suggestions. Uh, we at NEF, as the grant administrator for these three different grants, also have uh, some ideas that we want to share with you. Uh, so uh, in terms of the general project design, uh, be sure in your application and, and as you're developing um, the description of, of your project or program uh, to explain how the project or program will improve educator capacity and confidence as STEM and environmental educators. Um, that's one of the overarching goals of NEEF Screening STEM Initiative. We suggest as well that you include as many of the four instructional approaches as is reasonable for the program or project design. We recognize that uh, not every uh, project uh, or program will be able to hit on all four, but the more the better. Then also, please be sure to describe specific learning objectives and performance indicators, as well as any formative or summative learning assessments that you plan on using. Uh, we really do believe that this greening STEM model can have uh, an enormous impact, uh, but if it's not documented and if we aren't sure what we're, we should be looking for and evaluating, um, it's hard then to share with the larger audience uh, that we all uh, answer to. Uh, so please um, be giving thought to that. Uh, it's really truly important that, that we have uh, some metrics that, that we can report out on. We also encourage uh, engaging learners by utilizing science and engineering practices, which come from the next gen science standards. There's eight of them. And uh, examples include environmental monitoring or citizen science projects. And, and I cite those examples because it was way back in 2015 or so, uh, the first time we did this grant with the National Park Service that we realized that those were really great um, activities around which to build uh, a program. Then of course, we ask that you consider using our Greening STEM Implementation Guide and other NEEF resources, which can be found on our Greening STEM Hub at neefusa.org. And then lastly, not that anybody would do this, um, but, Sometimes it does seem to happen um, when people are, are trying desperately to find funding because we know that there's more need than there is funding. Um, but please try to avoid uh, f to f the, an attempt to fit an existing square peg into a round hole without retooling it so that it aligns with greening stem. In terms of uh, the applications, for the grants. Uh, keeping it short here, uh, there are four things that, that we know from our past experience um, that we'd like you to, to pay attention to. The first is to provide detailed descriptions whenever possible. We realize that as you're developing a project or program that uh, it's not possible to know every detail at the beginning, uh, but the better the description, the easier it is for reviewers uh, to understand what is being proposed, what will be delivered, uh, really goes a long way uh, to uh, generating a positive review. Second, make sure to address all application questions completely. 
we try to allow enough space for folks to uh, answer uh, any of the, the questions in depth. Uh, but sometimes uh, we realize that people get excited or, or perhaps um, are distracted in the process. But uh, again, for the reviewer's benefit, it really helps if you've addressed all of the application questions as completely as you can. Um, and then if you want to tell us additional information about your organization or your partners or, or other things, um, we welcome that. Uh, but when we're reviewing, we're really looking to make sure that we're funding uh, the best proposals. So keep that in mind. Also, we ask that you include support letters and these are very important because of the collaborative nature of the Greening STEM model and the fact that we're really looking to help folks establish relationships if they don't already have them, or if they do exist, to take them to that next level so that they're even more uh, impactful in their communities. So the support letters need to acknowledge the specific nature, structure, history, and any current activities and they should also show a knowledge of and support for whatever the proposed project or program. Uh, I know sometimes there's MOUs that have been in place for a number of years, uh, and those are legitimate and, and they do carry weight. But what uh, really gets a reviewer's attention is when there's a letter that speaks directly to the program or project being proposed. And then lastly, um, when it comes to the budget, we don't want folks to, to shortchange themselves. We, we want to fully fund projects if, if we can. Um, and sometimes the, the difference between getting a better review and, and not, a not so good one boils down to, can we understand in the budget what's being proposed and is it reasonable? So it's best to avoid bundling expenses and use individual line items whenever uh, you can with detailed descriptions. At this time, we're going to go ahead and offer uh, folks a chance to speak with each of the agency reps regarding the particular grant available from either the Park Service, the Forest Service, or BLM. We're going to allow um, probably 10 minutes uh, for this. And if there needs to be follow-up, please feel free to exchange contact information and make appointments for any follow-up uh, conversations. And that includes with uh, NEF. So if you do have something today that isn't specific to uh, the Park Service, the Forest Service, or BLM, you're welcome to stay in the main room here uh, with myself and uh, we can talk. Otherwise, uh, please go ahead at this time and join one of the breakout rooms. Well, welcome back everyone. We hope that you had a, a few minutes to connect uh, and if need be, uh, schedule uh, some follow-up conversations. Uh, we're quickly approaching the top of the hour, so we're going to wrap things up. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, Linda, Rachel, and Rachel uh, for participating today. Uh, you can see that uh, on our website, we have currently uh, all three grants open. Uh, you are welcome to, to go ahead uh, and download uh, information, uh, the RFA, a copy of the grant application. Uh, if you do have questions, please feel free to follow up either with uh, a specific agency rep or with myself. Uh, there are specific contact info uh, in each of the different uh, RFAs. And hopefully uh, come end of April, we're gonna have a, a whole slew of really robust proposals to review and we'll be uh, distributing funds uh, provided uh, they're available uh, before the end of the school year and uh, in the fall uh, the successful proposals will begin implementing their their projects and programs so uh, thank you all yes Robert? 
I did have a question um, from a potential partner in my breakout room. Yes. And they were wondering if um, their local park that they've been working with applies for one of these 21st Century Learning Centers grants. Would they be able to have the funding available for this summer, as in July or so? Or do, would it have, how long does it take once the uh, the grant applications have been submitted before they could actually implement? You know, that that's an excellent question. And our goal is to be able to uh, distribute funding in June. So it might be cutting it a little close for this summer, but uh, if, if, you, if you could, we, we should schedule a follow-up uh, with those folks and explore this further because we certainly would like to accommodate them if we can. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, then. Uh, again, thank you everyone for coming today and uh, learning a little bit more about NEAF, about greening STEM, and the current grant opportunities available with the National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service, and the Bureau of Land Management. Good luck, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Uh, either online in the virtual world or perhaps one day uh, out there in the real world. So thank you all. <laughs>